Welcome back to The Authentic Christian. My name's Aaron, this is Tucker, this is Scott, and today we talk about, is the church made of perfect people? Okay, so uh, we're talking today about the church, all right? And is the church made of perfect people? Um, Over my life, I've been a member of a few different churches, and I have had a lot of people say at different times, maybe it's people I'm studying with, and they'd say, well, your church is full of hypocrites. And I'm normally like, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I've been a hypocrite at many times in my life, right? Now, that's not the goal. Mm -hmm. The goal is to not be a hypocrite. But let's talk about the church. Is the church made of perfect people? Is it made of hypocrites? Let's start out with talking about what is the church? Uh, Scott, what if somebody asked you what is the church, how would you answer that question? Well, <clears throat> the Greek word for it is ekklesia, and it means the called out people, right? Out of the world in the sense of uh, God's kingdom, mm-hmm. it means those people who have been called out from a life of worldliness mm-hmm. into a life of being in that relationship with God. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like, the word ekklesia, ek, means out of, and kaleo is the word that means to call. So ek, kaleo, you put together ekklesia, right? That's cool. And so it's used in the New Testament it really means an assembly, a group of people that are called out. In Acts 19, that word is used of just an assembly that's not the church. It's a group of people that assemble together. Mm -hmm. But the New Testament, like Scott said, the way it's normally used, which has relevance to us really in the conversation today, is people that are called out of a sinful world and they're transformed into God's kingdom on earth. All right. So Colossians 1.13, translated into the the kingdom Mm -hmm. of his dear son. So it's a group of called out people, but those people that are called out from the world, when they become Christians and they're added to the church, that's another thing. Acts 2.47 says they were added to the church. Those who were saved were added to the church. Now, some translations say those who were saved were added to them, but Acts 5.14 says they were added to the Lord and the church is his body, Ephesians 1.22 and 23. So you go from being a lost person to being added to the church, the New Testament church. When that happens you automatically become perfect, and you have no form or flaws. Right, Tucker? Exactly. No. <coughs> Just like that. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, well, one thing, like, you know, everybody's just striving every day to do the best they can. Um, when you look at the book of First John, it reminds us, like, you know, when you're Christians, you're going to mess up, mm-hmm. you know, but you strive to be as sinless and do the right thing as best as possible, mm-hmm. but you're going to mess up. Like, Yo, when you become a Christian, you don't automatically, like, I remember whenever I was baptized, I didn't come up out of the water and be like, wow, I have no more temptation. No, no. you come up out of the water, um, and then you still have to strive against those things. I mean, yeah. we talked about this when we were talking earlier. People are imperfect, right? Even, even people that are Christians. Think about Peter. Peter did what? He denied Jesus. He told Jesus when Jesus talked about going to the cross, he said, no, Lord, no, not you, Matthew 16. And Jesus told Peter, get behind me, Satan. That's right. Yeah, so all throughout the New Testament, and even in the Old Testament, you see examples of people who were God's children, and yet they still struggle with a lot of different stuff. Yeah. I wrote down a note like, yeah, I thought it was really cool. I heard it from someone say it. They said, literally, the Bible is like this collection of different people from different lifestyles, different backgrounds, who have all like messed up and needed God like throughout the whole thing. It's not like these perfect people, like some people had a speech problem, some people were nervous, some people were afraid, like, you know, they messed up in sin and sexual sin and all kind of different sin, like... But yet, like, God was patient with them. Yeah. Yeah, like First Corinthians, Romans, all the epistles. I mean, just about all the epistles, right? They're, they're addressing problems or issues or something, some kind of shortcoming. Mm-hmm. Especially First Corinthians. Everybody thinks about that. Well, they had a lot of problems that were addressed in that book. I mean, that's a member. Those are members of the church. They're they're imperfect people. You mentioned Peter. Peter later on in his life even still made mistakes. And Paul had to withstand him to the face because <clears throat> he was taking part in something that many would call. I would call uh, something like racism. Racism. That's exactly. Right. I mean, yeah. Galatians I chapter two. Call that. Galatians chapter two is what Scott's referencing, and you have Peter who's eating with the Gentiles, and then some of the guys, some of the the other Jewish people, Jewish Christians show up, the Judaizers. And Peter withdraws himself. He's like, whoa, whoa, no, no, no. I mean, mm-hmm. and Paul, it says what Paul withstood him to his face. Can you yeah. imagine that being Peter? <laughs> Can you imagine yeah. being the others like Barnabas who's there? And you yeah. have Peter doing this and Paul standing up to imagine Peter. Imagine being there when two apostles are, are yeah. uh, in That's a confrontation. You, well, and the thing about it too is <laughs> you see how Peter, <coughs> like Paul rebukes him and it doesn't, it, Peter took it. I mean, Peter didn't mm-hmm. fight it from what we understand. He didn't fight. He just was he's basically recognized, wow, I'm being a hypocrite. Okay, there goes is the hypocrite full of churches. Yeah. In Galatians 2, Peter was being a hypocrite, right? He was 
playing the role. That's what the word hypocrite means. It's the Greek word comes from two words, uh, uh, hupo, which means like hypodermic, under, and krino is the Greek word means judging. Yeah. So under judging. And yeah. That might, you know, what does that mean? Well, hypocrite's like what? It's a transliteration of the word, and it, it, they used it for actors. That's right. They yeah. put on a face. That's right. right. So basically, that's the word they used for stage actors who were wearing a mask. Yeah. That's really what it was. That's what yeah. Greek culture used that word for. So whenever Peter, Paul, rebukes him, what he's basically saying is, look, you're acting like you're a Christian, but you've basically, under that, you're playing an actor because you're not really acting like You're saying you're a Christian, but you're not acting like it. Paul rebukes him, and what does Peter do? He repents. Yeah. And later, you've got him calling Paul his beloved brother. You know, yeah. he didn't say, like, well, Paul embarrassed me, so I'm going to. Yeah, so what's a takeaway from that? Even sometimes our most trusted leaders will do things that they need to change. Yeah. yeah. And w- the way we handle them and the way we handle ourselves and treat each other needs to be based upon what that person does once they see that they've done wrong, once w- yeah. once they've recognized that. How did they react to that? Yeah. Uh, did they actually change or did they continue doing the same thing? So it's not that. You're going to be looking at an institution full of perfect people. Uh, you, you said, what, what, what happened when you first became a Christian? Well, one of the things that first happened to me when I first became a Christian, I wasn't instantly perfect. I'm still not perfect, yeah. but I became a lot more aware of my imperfections. I suppose that was the biggest change. I, was, I, was, I then knew what I was doing wrong. Sure. I knew what thoughts I was having and, and how they were not appropriate. Like uh, maybe I felt more anger about some things than I should have felt. Uh, so becoming a Christian is about recognizing those imperfections and then starting to work on them. Not that you're instantly different. Yeah. Anyway. No, I mean, that's, that's brilliant. You're exactly right. And like what Tucker talked about, you think about all, if, if humans wrote the Bible, right, do you think that they would have included all of these character flaws? I mean, if I, like, let's be honest, okay? If I was writing a book about myself, maybe I would include a lot of the dumb stuff that I've done, but it's kind of embarrassing. Yeah. So I probably would... Most humans, when they write a book, they talk about all the great things in their life. They kind of gloss over things. You know, we always remember things like as better than they were. Yeah. When you look at the Bible, like you mentioned, Old Testament, New Testament, people made a lot of mistakes. Well, like, you know, there's going to be people that maybe have their nose up in the air, and they might think that they're better. Um, but at the end of the day, like, no one deserved Jesus at all. Like, I didn't deserve Jesus no more than you deserved Jesus. So, like, when you think of, like, what Scott was saying about what is the church, it's like it's Jesus' bride. And there's there are a lot of people out there that say they're the church and like they're, you know, divides up into a million different faiths and stuff. Maybe not a million, but you know. Um, so it's like, it's neat to just look back at the scripture and say like, okay, they messed up. They're in the church, the one church that Jesus built, but like they still struggle. Um, it gives us hope that God's patient with us, um, that Jesus is there for us, that we read this, what the Holy Spirit wrote and just hang on to that. Yeah. I mean, I- I've heard this quote many times. My older brother is the first one I can remember saying it. But if there was a piece said, if there was a perfect church, either they wouldn't let you in or you'd ruin it. Yeah. I mean, it's true. Like, if I went to a perfect church, I'd find something to do to ruin it. So the New Testament church that we're, that we're talking about wasn't perfect, all right? Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that we have this attitude of, well, we're going to sin, so we might as well just not even try. No, we're supposed to try to always yeah. grow and perfect ourselves. But you, the reason... You know, I was telling, I think Tucker this maybe, we were having coffee. I said, the reason I'm a member of this New Testament church is not because, the. Uh, let me find the right way to word this. <clears throat> the reason I'm a member of it is not because of the other members, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not a member of the New Testament church yeah, because exactly. I think Tucker is um, going to never hurt me or Scott, right? You may be at a New Testament church, a church of Christ, that has lots of people yeah. who are hypocrites in it. I'm not going to leave the church because this guy's a hypocrite. Let's say that I'm at yeah. church and some guy does something really awful and mean to me. I'm not going to leave the church because of that guy. I'm there to worship Jesus. It's the church that Jesus shed his blood for. Acts 20:28, 20, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Yeah. The yeah. church is uh, it's more like a place we come together for that spiritual healing, right? That's right. It's full of people who are trying to fight against their temptations and their shortcomings, and they're trying to find ways to overcome them. <clears throat> for the most part, everybody that comes there, in some sense— wants to be more like Jesus. Yeah, sure, there are some people that come in who are intentionally plotting and planning to try to take advantage of mm-hmm. people, you know, charlatans and whatnot, people that are trying to, to make gain off of others because they see an opportunity through religion to create some kind of scheme to con people. That happens. That's yeah, real. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, for the most part, your average congregation every day, there's going to be people with flaws. Mm-hmm. They know they have flaws. Mm-hmm. We all know each other's flaws. We get to mm-hmm. know each other. But... um 
that's why we're there. We're yeah. not there because we're perfect. We're there because we have those things and we know that we need help with them. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, that, that, that's the, that's the point you have to remember. You have to keep that perspective. The yeah. church is not supposed to be for perfect people. It's for people to come seeking perfection so yeah. that they can try to learn how to be that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you look throughout the New Testament. I mean, I, the passage I've got pulled up here is, is Mark chapter 2. And if I look at Mark chapter 2 and verse 17, listen, listen to what Jesus said. Verse 17, because in verse 16, okay. When the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? They're like, why is he hanging out with those people, right? Listen to Jesus' response. And that we can apply this in the church, verse 17. When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous. He means those self-righteous people. N- none's righteous. No, not one. All right? Mm-hmm. Romans 3.23, we've all sinned and fall short continually. It doesn't say yeah. we've all sinned and fallen in the past. It says we've all sinned and fall short. I believe that's the tense of the glory of God. So he, Jesus says, look, I didn't come to call the righteous, those self-righteous people, right? I came to call sinners to repentance. Yeah. John the Baptist, whenever the people came to him and basically said they had no sin, John's like, well, I'm not baptizing you because you don't think you got any problems. Mm-hmm. That's the hardest thing in life is getting us as Christians and non-Christians to realize like, hey, you need a Savior. Yeah. You know? I mean, we're one in Christ and we're buried with him. You know, we're not on different levels. Like, we're all one together. We're Jesus' bride. <clears throat> um, I think it was actually yesterday we were drinking coffee and we were going through the book of Revelation. Yeah. And whenever... They're pointing out the good things and bad things about the seven churches. Um, you know, it's just interesting because, like, everyone had they had some good stuff. Yeah. They had some bad stuff. Yeah. Some lost their first love. And we talked about they could be evangelizing. They loved God so much, but then they just stopped maybe sharing Jesus with people. And, you know, like, so you're going to find that everywhere you go. Yeah. And that's, that's like, um, oh, I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, that, that, that reminds me and thinks about, you know, Ephesians talks about the idea of a body and how we're all to grow together in that to the purpose of we become this functional working together in unity body that becomes mature and then uh, takes on that fullness. Uh, how does it say it? Under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 4.13, that mm-hmm. idea of growing up into him in all things, Ephesians 4.15. Yeah. goes right along into that. We're, we're all little pieces of something that's coming together and learning how to work together and grow together to what point to, to yeah. represent Christ well, to take on that image of him in our lives, and then to spread that to others. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's beautiful. It's exactly right. It's a family. What's yeah. so? Yeah, what y'all said it one day at the at the end of an episode. You're like, man, that's that's real family. And like you know, being in a church, it is like that real spiritual family. Like, you know, maybe your friends or family leave you, but you the church is there for you. And I love what you said, Aaron. Like um, at the end of the day, you know, if you did me wrong, you did me wrong. I'm not there worshiping God because of y'all too. Like I'm there because of Jesus and how much you know He loved me first. So I may you know I get to love Him back, and I'm there for Him. Um, you know, so we're going to run into those people that are, are bad or make mistakes. And maybe you see them in a different part of their life. You're like, man, they just had a bad day. Maybe they need you. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and you, Scott talked about a family growing up and you talked about the reason, one of the reasons we go to church, Hebrews 10 talks about it. Yeah. I was about to mention Okay. That. All right. I'm glad you get it. Okay. First. Well, so I'll let you hit on that. Hebrews 10. What's the purpose of us going to church? Well, the, when we, okay. When we say church, it's mm-hmm. ecclesia. It's the people. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. someone's going to say, well, he, we don't go to church. The church the building. Well, it has I'm multiple I'm meaning. One exactly. of it yeah. is the people. Another yeah. is the gatherings or the actual assembly That's correct. itself. That's so right. So it has multiple definitions. That's you right. You can look that up in Strong's and Thayer, different places. You'll see that. But I was thinking about Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, of course. Yep. Uh, specifically, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And then it's also about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. So uh, we're coming together because we need to be encouraged yeah. and exhorted towards mm-hmm. love and good works. Yeah. It's not an automatic thing that just happens. We have to have the ingest of the scriptures ourselves. We have to read them or study them or hear them preached, take them to heart. And we also need to have other people that are going to be there nudging us along Mm -hmm. and and constantly saying, hey, we should do this. We should do this. This is something that uh, you can do to serve the church and the community. That good works, right? That idea of doing those things. So it's, it's, anyway. No, uh, you're exactly right. It's encouraging. I want to hear hear your side of it too, or whatever you had to comment. No, I mean, pretty much exactly what you said. And that is, you know, there may be some, uh, some, Lord's Day, Sunday morning, first day of the week, when, when we're commanded, 1 Corinthians 16, to come together on the first day of every week, Acts 20 and verse, uh, verses 6 and 7. 
there may be some mornings where I know in the past I've been like, man, I felt on cloud nine. I felt spiritually like healthy. And, but there are others who are at that congregation who need you to encourage them. Yeah, yeah. they need you there on yeah. cloud nine, as you said. It, so to to you can bring them up. Bring them up. Yeah, and right. encourage them. And there's been other times where <clears throat> I've been going through rough stuff in my life and I just am like down. You know, sometimes where I'm like, <sighs> yeah, we talk about yeah. the five acts of worship sometimes. Mm-hmm. You'll hear sermons on that. Mm-hmm. You'll talk about singing and, and prayer and giving back and uh, taking the Lord's Supper and hearing mm-hmm. preaching. Maybe we don't emphasize enough the fact that we need fellowship. It's just yeah. as important, and these verses yeah. and others like it speak to that fact. We have to have it if yeah. we're going to be healthy as an individual, yeah. and then as a body of believers, we must do that one for another. Kind of like an immune system, I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you have parts of the body that help to strengthen other parts of the body and protect and defend other parts of the body. Yeah. When you might be going through something that you're not able to deal with <laughs> by yourself, Mm -hmm. but that's what the church is designed to do, function as a body. And so I may have something that I'm I'm able to do, provide as a service towards you that's going to help you to overcome that. But you wouldn't have that if we didn't have that fellowship that's important for us to have to stay spiritually healthy. Amen, man. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. you're like Ron, like he's preaching. That's right. man. Preach on, You're exactly right. I mean, there are times (coughs) when you need encouraged by others. Well, like... I love that we're not supposed to be an island, that mm-hmm. I know at 3 a.m. I can call you guys and y'all be there for me mm-hmm. to know that y'all got my back, that, that you know, that, you know, I remember on August 15th of 2017 when I was about to be buried in Christ, like, you know, my, my, my wife, she wasn't my wife yet, but Megan was right there, and then Bruce Hatcher, the preacher, was right there, and uh, he's about to baptize me. I just remember thinking, like, I'm just doing this because I want to be in Jesus' church, and God will add me to it and wash away my sins. And like when I came out of the water, I wasn't like perfect. Just like you said, like, like it's an everyday, you know, I'm going to try to do better. I'm going to let go of that sin, try to do better. Um, and know that I got you guys to have my back through all that. Well, yeah. look, that's Galatians 6, 1 and 2, right? Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, maybe not specifically everything that you're talking about, but the idea yeah. of you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted, but bear ye one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ, whether that's a temptation that you're struggling with, whether that's just you're going through some kind of depression because you've lost a loved one, you need encouragement, you need something to help push you through. Um, that's what we're there for. for it, yeah. it goes on to say 6.3, For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself, but let every man prove his own work. Yes, there's a sense in which we do bear our own burdens, and we do support ourselves, but we're a part of that body. And... Anyway, the the point yeah. is six two really sums it up. Bear ye one another's burdens, right? We're here to help one another along that path. We wouldn't need that help if we were perfect people. So the fact is, imperfect people, God's designed an institution for you. Yeah, and that's the church. Yeah, yeah. I, in the next several episodes, the next few weeks, we're going to be dropping an episode about denominations and church history. But um, I wanted to mention that because. It's so important once you like learn about the church, like just Jesus's church, just <coughs> just belonging to Jesus. Like it's so important to just stick with Him, stick with what He He designed because there's nothing better than just what He made the church to be. Um, even, even though people like try to confuse stuff, like you know, the God uh, God made everything simple. You just look back to Scripture and you see this beautiful thing that He prophesied that's coming, which is the church. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. It's it it makes me comforted inside that. You know, he did that because now I know I have a support team. Yeah, and they're, yeah. they're not perfect people. But yeah, we, we all need spiritual doctrine of some sort, right? And and Jesus talked about that. He said he came to, to seek after those who are sick. Yeah. That what the, the healthy don't need the doctor, but he came yeah. to seek those who are sick. Yeah. Matthew nine, twelve through thirteen talks yeah. about some of that. Yeah. Hey guys, thanks for listening to the Authentic Christian Podcast. This podcast has been sponsored by GBN, Gospel Broadcasting Network. You can download the app and start streaming every show, watch every episode, and discover the answers to life's biggest questions today. One of the things, I always like, I always think of things, when we talk about God's will, God's desire, I always think about the devil too, because I always think about the, the devil is so sly and sneaky, mm-hmm. the way he works. Um, there are a lot of people out there that will say, you don't need to really, you don't need to come together. You don't need to have a, a church community, right? There's this idea of joining a church, and I'm not going to get off into a tangent on this, but you are added to the church. In Acts 2.47, 5.14, whenever you're saved, you're added to the church. Mm-hmm. Whenever you're added to the church, you're saved. You yeah. can't have one without the other. There's a lot of people, there's this idea in you know modern 
religion, uh, Christianity, that sometimes it acts like it's Christianity, but it's not biblical, where they say, well, I want to, I want Jesus, I want to be saved, but I don't want to be a member of the church. Yeah. You can't. They're interconnected. God says when you're saved, you're added to the church. Now, the devil doesn't want you to understand that because he wants you to think, I can be saved, but I don't need to go assemble with the Lord's church. Yeah. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, I'll get doctrinal for a second, what we're talking about. It says you're supposed to encourage one another and exhort one another, right? Well, if I'm the devil, I don't want you doing that. Mm-hmm. I don't want I don't want if Aaron skips service, I don't want Tucker and Scott to give him a call. Hey man, you doing okay? What's going on? I don't want that. If I'm the yeah. devil, I want you to be an island. Yeah. I want you to say, you know what? Stay home. Don't worry about it. Don't you, you know, think you can do it by yourself? Yeah, you think you can do yeah. it by yourself. And then what happens? If you look at Hebrews chapter 10, these people were, verse 25, forsaking the assembly. That means they were willfully abandoning Christianity. They were people who were Jews, the Hebrews, written Hebrews. They became Christians. They were leaving Christianity because of persecution and other things. And they were leaving. And look what happens. Go over to verse, uh, go to verse 29. Okay. I'm not going to read the whole section. Um, verse 26, let's go there. If these people abandon Christianity, and this can be the same thing today for anybody watching. If you're a Christian and you abandon Christianity, abandon Jesus, you can fall away. We'll do another episode on the idea of once saved, always saved. Listen to this passage, verse 26. For if we, who's we? The church. The Christians. church Christians. If we sin willfully, after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. You had salvation from your sins. If you abandon Christianity and mm-hmm. sin willfully and don't repent, you don't have that anymore. Keep reading. Go over to verse, uh, I'm not going to read the whole section. Go to verse 29. Of how much worse punishment, what's worse than death? That's what earlier is talking about Old Testament, how they died. What's worse than uh, physical death? Well, spiritual death. Yeah. How much worse punishment, spiritual death, do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has, here's what you do when you leave Christianity, trample the Son of God underfoot. You stomp on Jesus. All right? You're stomping on Jesus. That's what it's saying. Trample the Son of God underfoot and count the blood of the covenant. Whose blood is that? Jesus' Jesus blood. blood. By which he was sanctified, a common thing. This guy's been sanctified, okay? And it also says, and insulted the spirit of grace. This guy's not a person who's never been saved. He's saved. He's had a sacrifice for sins. He's been um, sanctified by the blood of the covenant, by Jesus' blood, and he tramples all over it. That's what leaving Christianity is. And if I'm the (coughs) devil, I want you to think, oh, no, you can't do that. You can never fall away. You can fall away. Yeah, I remember hearing, I remember driving growing up there to, uh, a town like 20 minutes away but there's this billboard and it said like come here it's a church for people who don't like church and it's like like we said like if you go back and you just see what jesus built there's nothing better than what he built and if you know there's gonna be unperfect people but um yeah i don't know i just thought well, of that when I was go, mean, to, you, go to like, ephesians you know what i'm going to talk about let's okay. talk about the church you know, go ahead and make your point while i'm flipping over there uh, i was just going to say you're talking about this idea of separating thinking that you can do it by yourself mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um that's divide and conquer from yep. the standpoint of the devil's tactics yep. and number two um it's just a, an attitude of pride and it's yep. the opposite of what we should have we should have humility we yes. see that over and over yes. again in the parable where jesus is <clears throat> speaking about a man uh, of the uh, was it the Pharisees that comes and prays yeah, Luke eighteen right yeah Pharisee right. and the publican tax that's right mm-hmm. and uh, the publican has a contrite heart and he mm-hmm. says have mercy on me and I know that I'm a sinner right James talks about this he talks about uh, uh, but God gives more grace wherewith he said God resisteth the proud but giveth grace unto the humble submit yourselves therefore to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you mm-hmm. anyway Luke eighteen that's a good story those guys are both in the temple. They're both children of God. Mm -hmm. They're both Jewish people. I like this story. And one is a Pharisee, right? He's the hypocrite. He thinks he's he's like, Lord, thank you for not making me like other men, right? Mm -hmm. We got to be careful we don't pray that, you know? He's like, thank you for making me not like like other men. I do, yada, yada, brags about all the stuff he does. And then you have the publican, the tax collector, who the Jewish people would look down upon. Oh, he's a traitor to Rome, all this. And he's like, Lord, have mercy on me because I'm a sinner. Yeah. He beats his breast. He doesn't even look up. He knows he's not worthy. And which man goes away justified? That man. That's right. right. The one that admits that he has imperfections. The humble one. That's, That's right. right. So don't let don't let a hypocritical person drive you away from the church because you're not there for them. You're there for Jesus. Mm-hmm. Jesus added you to his church. You mentioned that billboard. This brought a thought. Oh, yeah. Ephesians says that the church is the what of Christ? Ephesians 5. Is it the bride? Yeah, the bride, bride of Christ. Can you imagine saying that you love Jesus, you hate the church. You know how many times I've heard that? I got a book in my library a guy wrote mm-hmm. said they love Jesus but hate the church. Mm. That's like saying, Aaron, I really like you, but I can't stand Jamie. That's yeah. my wife. How do you think I would handle that? I'd be like, you think I want to hang out with you if you don't like my wife? 
No, Jesus shed his blood. That's how much he loves the church. He died for it. And someone says, well, I really don't like the church. Mm -hmm. Well, you might not like the people who treat you in specific actions that way, but don't let that keep you from being a member of Jesus' church. That's right. Yeah. I mean, we're not condoning hypocrisy. No, of course not. I mean, we're pointing out the fact that it does exist, Mm -hmm. and sometimes it exists unintentionally because people are trying to work on themselves. They're trying to let the Scriptures work on them, rather, is the better way to say that. Yeah. But um, we're not saying that hypocrisy is is a good thing itself, but we're just saying sometimes you need to understand what you're really coming into. You're going into a place that people are trying to find healing. That's right. And they're trying to get better. Yeah. So... And there have been times where I, I had a guy in Raleigh, his name was Jordan, and um, I, I, I was having coffee with him at a place called Sola. It was a really cool coffee shop. If you're watching Raleigh, <laughs> North Carolina, go check out Sola Coffee Cafe. But me and Jordan were sitting there, and he was actually, uh, at the time, not really a believer in anything like that, but he told me he had read an article by a big denominational church in the area, and he said that he thought the article was hypocritical, and he was expecting me to disagree, and I was like, yeah, I agree with you. And he was like, what? I said, Jesus hates hypocrisy too. Yeah. This was a local denominational church that was doing something that was hypocritical. He called him out on it, and I was like, yeah, Jesus agrees with you. Like, Jesus would agree with you. He hated yeah. hip- hypocritical stuff. He was, like, caught off guard. He's like, wait, <laughs> what? I'm like, yeah. yeah. I mean, when people say that the church, some people say church was a plan B. It was an accident. Like, Jesus, he failed. That's nonsense. Mm-hmm. Listen to Ephesians 3, 10 and 11, right? Ephesians chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, verse 10. This is what God thinks about the church. To the intent now that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose that he accomplished in Jesus Christ our the Lord. The church is the tool by which yes. that wisdom mm-hmm. is going to be known. So we're, God we're says, the ones to teach it and to show it. My eternal purpose of what Jesus, one of the things Jesus comes to do to make the salvation of mankind possible, and he makes what, he chooses what to make that known? The church. That's an honor to be a part of that church. Yeah. yeah. It is an honor. When uh, since we're in Ephesians, go to Ephesians four, fifteen through sixteen. Okay. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into Him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, the church, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective work by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body, the church, for the edifying of itself in love. That's right, man. Whether it's the church itself as an institution or whether it's the individual members teaching, mm-hmm. because God has given us uh, orders to do so, mm-hmm. or whatever the case may mm-hmm. be. God has chosen the church to be a way to give glory to himself and to make known his wisdom. That's right. And if God chooses it to make known his wisdom, then we should support that, and we should want to be members of it too. Everybody, we thank you so much for watching this episode of The Authentic Christian. Remember, if you go to a church that has hypocritical people there, welcome to the club. But we (laughs) should always be working and growing. And remember, we're at church for Jesus Christ. It's his bride, his body. Thanks for watching. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Authentic Christian Podcast. This podcast is sponsored by the Gospel Broadcasting Network, or GBN for short. You can hop on the App Store, search Gospel Broadcasting Network, and you can download the app. And there's this show, many other great shows that you can watch or listen to. Start learning more about the Bible and uh, why we're here, what our purpose is. Thanks for listening.